we have been fed in terms of having just a lovely time together, eating food, but also just that lovely time worshiping. We are here to meet with God, and uh, that one desire we have, that we have is that we'll be able to worship Him as God will, will want us to. And we will adore God, and through our time in the next uh, 30 or so minutes, we're going to continue our series from the book of Mark, and you have been really blessed to have wonderful uh, brothers here who have spoken so eloquently, you know, in terms of looking at the book of Mark. I always think of the book of Mark is that book that tells the story of Jesus to a Gentile in a way. And when you read it, it's almost like beyond the James Bond movie that you may have seen, it's Jesus in action. And you either believe that he's a prophet, or if you if you think about what the Pharisees in this fact say, it would just be an ordinary teacher. Or he was somebody with authority, God, King. Um, probably he's a lunatic, because he makes some very, very bold statements. So there's a lot um, from the book, and we're going to continue uh, from Mark chapter 7. And I don't know whether you want to flip your phone these days, or you have a Bible to open for those who are old school. Uh, whichever you fancy, uh, just put a finger there. A reporter was interviewing a 104-year-old woman and asked the question, what do you think is the best thing about being 104? She smiled and replied simply, no peer pressure. I guess, <laughs> I, I, I guess if my daughter is here, she'll say, oh, dad, not a dad joke. <laughs> yeah. But pressure, peer pressure, so many influences in our lives, in our society, whether it comes from the campus, whether it comes from society, whether it comes from family, from your friendship uh, groups or different circles of influence that you belong to, or whether it comes from religious circles. There seems to be pressure exactly on us these days to conform to a certain standard, a certain way of doing things, or a certain tradition. And in our, in, our, in our text today, it's an encounter that happened in Galilee. You have on one side Jesus and his disciples, then you have this massive crowd that were following him, and then you have religious leaders, the Pharisees, we call them Pharisees. You know, they were not only religious leaders, but political leaders of their time. And then I like the scribes, you know, they just write legal documents, but not only writing legal documents, they perform some administrative tasks. But it happened in Galilee. Why Galilee? You know, if you read the Gospels, you discover that Jesus did a lot of stuff in Galilee. It seems as if action happens in Galilee. Capernaum, Bethsaida, some of the towns, if you read the scripture, they will keep popping up. Jesus doing a lot of things there. And it's just really fascinating when I think about all the pressure that we, we face on a daily basis. And I've asked the question, so how do we say no? Or how do we respond to pressure to conform to standards or traditions in society or within religious circles or on our campus? Should we even say no? If we have to say no, why? Billy Graham, uh, I think most of us will know him, a very renowned uh, evangelist, one of the fathers of our faith. He made a statement in the past, and when I saw it, I thought of how true it is today. He said, and I quote, there are those today that say we must do as others do, that we must conform to the world to win it, that we must swim with the tide, that we must move with the crowd, but the believer should say no. Now let's look at our text uh, for today. And before I read it, I think chapter 6 is such an interesting action pack chapter whereby Jesus started by sending his disciples two by two to go. They went in obedience and they were able to, to do great stuff. Imagine, just picture with me, two by two they went. They were able to cast out demons, you know, they were able to anoint people with oil and the sick got healed. Then somehow, Mark then brought us into that story of Herod, who probably is feeling guilty about what he did with uh, John the Baptist and we understand how he beheaded John the Baptist just to please his daughter, but we know it was his wife. And then it moved again into that remarkable story of Jesus teaching and preaching, and the crowd 
the tongue again. I love sometimes the details we find in the gospel. You know, if you picture people were coming from the cities and some of the villages, and the Bible says they ran on foot just to go to where Jesus is. It's just a remarkable. You know, in our time, maybe we ride bicycles, we take a train, we may drive cars, but these people were running on foot. And if you know your Bible um, story very well, that area is not as clean and as clear as we have here. But they were running on foot and not proper boots or something like that. They were wearing sandals. Just so that you can picture that happening. You know, so that, 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 that was happening. And then after that, Jesus, because he's a good worshiper, all that excitement kept them very late. And then obviously they were hungry. The disciples came and said, you need to send them to the surrounding villages so that they would get food to eat. And Jesus asked, you feed them. Five loaves, two fish, you know the story, over 5,000 men, and then we're not even adding the children and the women who needed more. God fed with 12 baskets left. But I love how the story then moved from there, in the idea of worship. Jesus then told the disciples to go to the other side, and then he went on top of the mountain to pray. And probably it's getting dark by then. The disciples, you can imagine, they're rowing in the middle of the the river or whatever, and then Jesus started walking, and the truth talks about he almost walked past them, and they were terrified. They were terrified, and we picked that reading from uh, Mark six. I was start reading from fifty, so that's where we are. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them, and said to them, "Be of good cheer; it is I. Do not be afraid." Then he went up into the boat to to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marvel, for they had not understood about the laws, because their heart was hardened. 53. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through that whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard the words. Wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country, they led the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. 7. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread and with defile, eat bread with defile, that, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault, for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, peaches, and copper vessels, and couches. When the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it's written? This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching us doctrines, the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, and washing of peaches and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, All too well, you reject the commandment of God. And you keep, you make that you may keep your your tradition. Ten, for Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who causes uh, father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is common, that is gift to God, then you do no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition which you have handed down and many such things you do. We pause here and we continue. Let's come in our time to go and pray. Father, thank you for the authority of the word. Thank you for the reading of the word. And as we continue, Holy Spirit, we ask that you speak to us as individuals first and collectively as a group. Amen. 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 So this section uh, that we've read, um, I think if we unpack it, I, I look at it as the heart of the worshipper. There are many things that have happened here. First of all, um, 
one thing that kept on coming as we read, or as I was reading in, in preparation for this talk is uh, Proverbs 4.23 that talks about keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Out of the heart flow all our thoughts, all our works, all our choices, or all our actions in life. We see a lot of actors here. Let's start with the ultimate person that we've been looking at all through this series, Jesus, who is God, who is King. His heart was in the right place. You know, in chapter 6, we see him commissioning his disciples, giving them authority to go and teach, to go by themselves to learn some of the things that they have seen him do. And you can see him feeding multitudes, having compassion. That's what the Word of God says about that. He was healing the sick. Um, and in that uh, chapter uh, 6, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion. He had concern for the people. How about the disciples? Graham was talking about you know, how do we respond to the authority of, of God himself? Is it out of fear or out of trust? And I love the disciples because I see myself in their shoe in so many ways. They started with that authority, you know, going about teaching, performing these miracles, bringing healing and stuff. So it's almost like a movement from fear to faith and then later on to hard and hearts. So in verse 50, and 50 to 52 that we have read, you know, all that has happened to them, all the success they've had, you know, they did not even understand what Jesus said to them, you know, feed the multitude and, and they fed the multitude. But when they were now in the boat and the storms and the wind were coming around, you know, they could not identify with that authority that they had. So it's almost like they did not understand, you know, the reality of the divine nature of God. How about the people? Maybe some followed because of the miracle they saw, but they still followed Jesus. And in that uh, verse 53 to 56, we see that they followed, they heard, they received, they gave. Imagine that scene happening in Union Square or wherever, wherever people are bringing, for those of us, for those of you who are medical students or doctors, imagine they are like, you know, Jesus coming in and everyone comes down with all the beds, everything, mm -hmm. and he moves around, people stretch to touch the hem of his garment, and this massive healing, there's confusion, a lot of confusion happens. But they believe, and they touch, and they got healed. It's about the heart, what you believe, what you trade, and that brings out the action and the choices we make in life. But the religious leaders, and we're going to spend some time to look at them, because they're really funny. Um, you know, <laughs> they came on a fact-finding mission. Probably they were jealous of this story of Jesus' this popularity. Imagine people coming all over from cities to town, just following this supposedly, probably, very young man who was the son of a carpenter. And even his disciples were casting demons, you know, performing healing. And I think they came to convict Jesus for breaking the written law of Moses, but somehow they were just cowards. They couldn't pick on the man himself. You know who they picked? His disciples. Why are they not observing the ceremonial cleansing? You know, and I think their heart was not in the right place. Their hearts were hardened. But Jesus saw right through their hearts, right through their motives, their actions, and everything about them. And there's some of the things that I've just picked from um, the passage that we've just read, and I'm not going to go because into them verse by verse because of time. I think they were so fixated with custom of men instead of the inner realities of what it means to be a true follower of God. They understood the law, but they were so much into the custom of that, their time. They focused so much on sacrifice instead of mercy. And if you think about in that verse 2, and now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Mark was not talking about an issue of the sanitary practices of the disciples. It's nothing about any reference of the fact that they had their hands. It's just part of just this Jewish culture and tradition. Uh, it's always it's just an issue of outward holiness according to their tradition. I was reading the commentary and uh, one commentator was saying and when they do the washing of the hands, they, it's been accompanied by a prayer just to follow this ritual washing and they, maybe Graham, you may think about 
our song that goes this way. Blessed be thou, O Lord, King of the universe, who sanctified us by the Lord and the command of, and commanded us to wash the hands. They recite that, just washing hands. And if you think about it, like in verse 4, it talks about when they come from the marketplace. I try to imagine Union Square, maybe Busy Street, George Street, or wherever, or maybe on your campus. For a Jew going through that, there may be a lot of unclean people that he may see. Uh, when he may have touched something that is unclean, uh, when he returns, he has to wash. He may have touched Gentile along the way when he comes, he has to wash, and may have touched things. And I wonder whether, you know, the things that the Jew may have touched, it's more on the outside, the external stuff. But how about what he may have seen and thought about, attractive people? Or he may look at that one and say, oh, that just is no hope for him, the scene at all, or whatever. So there's a lot that goes in the heart. So even though he may wash himself and recite that beautiful blessed be thou, Lord, King of the universe, who sanctified us by the laws and commanded us to wash the hands, what about what happens on the inside? There seems to be nothing about that. So religious rituals and legalistic traditions are all over the place. You know, um, interestingly, growing up in, in Nigeria, very interesting. Sometimes. When the music is very loud, our parents assume that that's worldly. When it's soft, that's like Christian. In some, uh, when I was growing up, I remember a friend of mine, uh, the, 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 the daughters were playing Kirk Franklin, some revolution, I don't know if some of you know that. And it's very hip hop type song. <laughs> and the mother came and said, no, they need to turn that off. But when they play Celine Dion and others, that's sorry. That sounds more soft, you know. And so you can get away with playing with the Vandras, the Temptations, the Edition, I'm not telling you my own music and stuff. But when you play the, the hip hop or the Krikos rap that I'm used to, it seems not to go well. That's tradition, you know. There's that tradition then that you must dress properly. Like you guys are in church, some of us are wearing jeans. No, it's not, it's not acceptable. You know, it's traditional. I grew up with you need to really dress proper. Um, wear giant <laughs> stuff. <laughs> to come into the presence of God. It's all traditions. You know, there are a lot of traditions, and I think it's good for us to be able to check some of these traditions and see are they aligned to the teachings of the apostles, to, to the entirety of Scripture. Because we can take them out of context and form a doctrine around them. Do not wear earrings. You know, I remember then, she's nodding because we grew up in the same place. If you cut your hair and then it's one level that it's, it's like, no, 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 that's a good level. Mm -hmm. You know, so this were the things that were being brought into church. And there are traditions here, a lot of uh, tradition. I remember another story quickly, I'll say before we continue, of the fact that some men came, the bishop of a very big church, I'm not going to mention it because some of you know that church. Assembled some of his senior pastors and was talking about some of the things that he noticed happening in the church. The issue of spirituality, how you demonstrate how you're very spiritual. And he said he got conviction that they need to go back to the basics. You know, understand Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit. Allow the Spirit to live in them so that it can bear the fruit, not the walk of the Spirit or the gift of the Spirit. And most of the pastors thought that. We can come and move into that conference. All of us with a regalia where we can really powerful seated across that, that hall and just talk about the fruit of the spirit. Probably they thought even those who are being crushed in their churches can do something better. But he had a plan. He wanted to test them whether that is allowed for Christians to do that. I don't know. You may need to speak to him if you if you ever know that story. But he asked the waiters to when they come to just splash everything on everyone. And so they came, pretending as if they were tripping and just splash all the food for all these powerful men with their suits and tie and everything. And then what came out was very disturbing. He, he sat there and he could hear the F word, you fools, you idiots, you don't know how to do your job. How can you do that? So these men that came with so much of me have the spirit, gentleness, self control. 
patient. But you cannot, if I was in, this, in their shoes, I may have done that. But he, that's the point he was pointing, you know, we need to go into the basic. Out of the Spirit comes through your heart as you walk with the Spirit. The Spirit walks in your heart and makes you a far better person. And you'll be able to learn how to walk with God and bear the fruit of the Spirit. So they rejected the commandments of God and held on to the traditions of the elders. Established teachings that probably passed from one generation to another generation, mostly from parent to child. They relied more on the oral traditions that were at that time. Um, um, and also interpretations on top of the written law of God that they read. And even the issue of that covering in terms of the children setting aside the so-called gift to give to God and not taking care of their parent. They may have taken that from Numbers 31 to 2. I will just quickly read that. Moses spoke to the heads of the tribe of the people of Israel, saying, This is what the Lord has commanded. If a man vows a vow to the Lord or sways an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. So children not doing what they should. Some cultures, this is very strong, you know, being a parent, you raise your children so that they can become your pension plan. It doesn't happen in this part of the world. It doesn't happen in this part of the world. But you still get parents like going around and making sure the children can play football or sports or do some other stuff with the idea that maybe when, when it happens, they can retire early. But we see in this 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 story about um, People trying to twist the word of God. It's the commandment, the Ten Commandments. It's a very serious commandment that was given. The fifth commandment is about honor your father and mother. But they don't want to do that. And they just they say that they dedicated that money or those resources to God instead of taking care of um, their parents. But Jesus rejects that practice of using one biblical teaching to nullify another. You know, um, and try to then bring us into the second part about the correct or the right understanding of scripture. So I'll just quickly, what well, time is fast spent, quickly just read through uh, 14 to 23. If you're there with me, I'll read. When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There's nothing that enters the man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him. Those are the things that defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had entered the house, away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you those without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters the man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart or his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all food? And he said, What comes out of the man that defiles the man? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, uh, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. So in the Old Testament, certain foods are considered as unclean. That it's God's people were not supposed to eat them. This law taught the importance of purity. The last bit. Purity in a symbolic way. In Mark's gospel, what we see is Jesus declared all these foods as clean. Very, very, very controversial. Even in some some Christian circles, there are some some people feel that some food shouldn't be eaten. But we know that God has blessed everything. But I just want to say here that for me the Christian life is a journey, it's a personal relationship with God. So even though everything is clean, God only speaks to you about something. If I love eating my grapes and I can eat parts and parts and parts, I may just hear a whisper based on my my condition to reduce that. It's not that it's unclean, but it's not very good for me. So we also need to listen to what God says for our health issues. Or probably even wisdom, because it may just be you're spending too much on food and you're not taking care of other responsibilities you have. So it's helpful to remember that while particular prescription has gone away, the principle behind it has not changed. Purity is no less important today than it was in the old days or Moses' days. 
everything that stood as a symbol of purity in the Old Testament, you know, in a way points us to Christ, while the moral law remains, and other categories do not. Our hope never lies in our ability to obey any law. We cannot obey all the law. We have to rely on the Spirit of God to help us. Everything lies in Christ's perfect moral life and the unblemished sacrifice he made on our behalf, giving up his own body for all of us, so we can then put confidence, our confidence in him. So based on that, you know, we need to focus on Christ as we think about how do we express true worship. You know, we looked at the heart of the worshiper, then how can we, as worshippers of Christ, not like the Pharisees and the scribes, yeah, we may be like the disciples, but just that example of Jesus in terms of the authority of spending time with God in prayer and doing the right thing, teaching and stuff, right? We need to live a life of uh, love and, and faith as we see. But defilement therefore comes from an impure heart, not the violation of external rules. If you look at 15, uh, just take us back to 15, it says there is nothing that enters the man from outside which, which can defile him but the things which come out of him. Those are the things that define a man. And Mark was expanding on that towards the end, from 22, uh, that long list from 21, sorry, to 22, just different things. So it's sin, actually, that defines us, not necessarily what we eat. But I'm just going to conclude with uh, verse 8. And when I saw that verse 8, I, I, I glossed past it for weeks. And I was telling uh, Graham when I saw him yesterday. Um, Graham, I said Graham. Yeah. <laughs> She's not going to be happy because of that. But hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was talking to Graham. Um, verse 8. It's a simple verse. For laying aside the commandment of God, and there's a comma, you hold the traditions of men. Why do we hold the traditions of men? The traditional traditions of the elders, sometimes because we lay this out. We don't focus so much on the commandment. And I want us to quickly uh, just turn to Deuteronomy, probably because of our time. I think I have just about five or six minutes left, so um, I'll quickly, if we're there, just read that. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 to 7. 4 to 7 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Stop there. It's exclusive. It's total devotion to God. You would think that the Pharisees and the scribes should have known that. It's about the heart, it's about the soul, it's about the mind. And if you think it's just in the Old Testament, nah. Jesus reiterated this commandment in Matthew 22, 37 and 40. I'll read. And he said to them, I, he said to him, that's the lawyer who came to test him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law, all the prophets. So the heart of everything is not laying aside the commandment. And the commandment sometimes is very simple. We can pick up different traditions or different things and build a doctrine around them. But the summation of everything is to love the Lord our God with the whole of our heart, with the whole of our soul, with the whole of our, our mind and strength. But equally, to be diligent to teach Pass that to the next generation. Don't think those of you who don't have children in your life school. It talks about children, but it's the next generation. So beyond just the ones that are within our immediate family, people are people who are younger. We all have a responsibility in this church. We have young people in our church. Take notice of them after church as they move about. We all collect, we have a responsibility. Those who are older than us have a responsibility to teach and pass this biblical not tradition, you know, teachings of Christ, either on the pulpit or as we interact one with another in the church. We need to do that. It's so, so important. 
That's the commandment that they lay aside. Because when you lay aside that, then you start focusing on what you may have heard, what you may have noticed that is acceptable. But even if it's acceptable, we need to check and see those that agree with the act of Christ. And so the authority of Jesus teaching and making this bold proclamation and being challenged by the religious and political leaders of his time points them back to the reality of what it, what it means to be a worshiper, what it means to be a true worshiper, to measure our hearts in the right place. And when we're expressing, we're expressing it in love, in faith, in obedience, but in total devotion and dedication to God. And I'll close by quickly just reading uh, uh, Romans. I like Romans 12. I think uh, all of us may have already come to that to have. It talks about, I beseech you therefore, brethren, 12, 1 to 2, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not a renewed mind, a renewing, it's an ongoing process. That you may prove what is good, what is acceptable, and what is the perfect will of God. It's just complete, total dedication to God. It's not easy, you know. You know I told you about that story of those pastors. You know, imagine if that has happened. I, I, I sometimes, when I'm driving, I, I ask myself, are you actually filled with the Spirit? Because I'm driving and someone does something and I'm so ashamed of what comes out of me. So I need to ask God to do your work of miracle in my life to just I don't want anyone sitting next to me to hear what I say to that guy who just drove like that. Or I'm walking and somebody just driving and entered into the water and the pothole and, and splashes on me and then, oh. you yeah. know. But I'm human. We're human, so that's fine. You know, but the Spirit of God will whisper. And for me, I think that's what's important as a worshiper, that your spiritual anthem is attentive. It picks the right signal. You're not too busy and, uh, and doing other stuff and not committing yourself and being fed with the word on a daily, regular basis. If that's the word, daily, regular basis. Yeah. But that you're committed to God and to the things of God. And this is the right place. You know, you're part of a movement like this. You're plugging. Let's encourage one another. Iron sharpens iron. Let's continue to not neglect the fellowship that we have together. And let's just continue to be there. Accountability, partnership, if it happens, you know, as we worship together, we have questions, team, the right one there, just go to team, you know, over there. You know, uh, all the tough questions in life, just. <laughs> you know, he has the capacity for that. E. Stanley Jones, in his commentary, on this particular passage concludes that the religious leaders left their criticism while Jesus left the conversion. They picked flaws while Jesus picked followers. How about you and I, Christian? You know, as we go about our Christian work, do we do we leave behind criticism? Do we pick flaws in what's happening in people's lives? Or uh, do we Trying to live here in conversion, just making that effort to lead people to Christ or to be there walking alongside them to help them to grow. How would we respond? Let's, let's, let's cross with a prayer. So just take a moment. Um, I think it's appropriate to just ask the question once you close your eyes or if you want to open it, it's okay. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Even now, um, I don't know what he wants to say to you. Do you need to present yourself, as we read in Romans, as a living sacrifice? You're dead to sin, but you're alive in Christ, with a heart that is dedicated and exclusively devoted to God. Or maybe if you want to open your heart to God in prayer and let him in, that's not a pleasant thing to do, but it's so refreshing that you open yourself and say, God, here am I, I'm just me. You know me, nothing to hide. We sang that song, thank you, Greg. Nothing here is hidden. We're here to do business with God. 
not any spirit. He made God who searched that innermost part of your heart and revealed the things that you need to, to lay aside, not the commandments, the traditions or whatever, or habits or things that you do you need to lay aside and just, just release yourself to God. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have been having just looking at the book of Mark, such a powerful book. Thank you for the authority that we find in Jesus, his teaching, his miracles. It's almost like Jesus on power wheels going about doing marvelous things. I ask, Father God, that you will help us to have the right heart of worship. It's all about you. The heart that is consecrated, the heart that is set apart to do the things of God, the heart that desires to be in your presence, desires to know you more and more, desires to grow, a heart that is never satisfied with the ordinary, but also a heart that is able to filter the different customs, traditions, or the ways of life that we are being bombarded with, sometimes even from the pulpits or from different channels from social groups, social media. Help us to have a balanced, balanced view and, and a very comprehensive understanding of Scripture so that we can be able to stand in the days that we're in. Help us, Father God, to be yes, that living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. We're dead to the things of this world. We're alive in Christ. Help us as we journey even in our time, either studying or young professionals walking, interacting with people. Let's not be like the Pharisees in the scribe, whereby we look at the external stuff. But let us see people where they are. And probably you will not just into speaking about our faith or helping them to know you more. Help us to be people who are making a difference wherever we are. But more importantly, help us to let ourselves be filled with your spirit so that we can bear quality fruit, not just fruit of our, of, of our labor as we walk with you, but fruit of our character. That we people who have love, who love deeply, who are patient, who are kind, who are, who are good, who, are, who have self-control, who are gentle. And as we do that, God, we will be able to express that in our worship, in our prayer, in our obedience to your word, in, in our singing, in our, in, our, in our way of life. And we ask for the Spirit that you help us to do that. And thank you for that promise. There is no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ. Whatever may happen in the past, one, when we are in you, you have taken care of that. So help us as we continue in our journey to live a victorious life.